Now that we've completed the process of filtration and made a filtrate, we have to move to the second step of urine formation. That's reabsorption. Your total plasma volume is filtered into your renal tubules about every 22 minutes. Tubular reabsorption reclaims most of that filtrate. We have a lot of stuff in that filtrate we really want back. Some stuff moves through the epithelial cells of the tubules. This is called transcellular reabsorption. Paracellular reabsorption occurs if the molecules can travel between the tubule cells. Now this can really happen only in the proximal convoluted tubules which have more spaces between the cells. Throughout most of the renal tubule, the epithelial cells are held together with tight junctions. Active tubular reabsorption requires ATP. This is going to be primary or secondary active transport. But many molecules move through passively by diffusion, facilitated diffusion, or osmosis. Water and solutes may go straight through the cell, that transcellular route, to get back into the blood. They are taken in by active transport, they diffuse across the cell, and then leave the cell to get into the blood. Others may go in between the cells. This is the paracellular route. Tubular reabsorption of sodium is a primary active transport process. If we're saving sodium, we have to dump potassium. A positive ion has to be given up if we're taking in a positive ion. Most nutrients are reabsorbed by secondary active transport. Typically, they tag along with sodium. We're actually transporting sodium, but there's a seed on the transporter for something else. Glucose, amino acids, some ions, and some vitamins move this way. There is always passive absorption of water. Wherever sodium goes, water follows. Passive tubular reabsorption occurs when water leaving the filtrate creates a diffusion gradient for solutes. This means that things can just now diffuse across the cell membrane. Lipid soluble molecules can always diffuse across and urea is a diffusible product. Many things have what's called a transport maximum or a threshold. Once a certain amount of something has been reclaimed from the filtrate and returned to the blood, no more of that will be reclaimed. For example, glucose has a transport maximum of about 180 milligrams per deciliter. Once that blood level has been achieved, any additional glucose will leave in the urine. The proximal convoluted tubules are the most active in reabsorption. All of the nutrients, 65% of the sodium and water, the bulk of ions, half of the urea, and nearly all of the uric acid that was in the filtrate will be reabsorbed here. The urea and the uric acid are a little unfortunate. We really want to get rid of them, but they passively get reabsorbed. In the nephron loop, we're adjusting water and ions. The descending loop will allow water but not ions to leave the filtrate, and the ascending loop will allow ions but not water to leave. This is really more involved in concentrating or diluting the urine. In the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, hormones play a role. Antidiuretic hormone will cause us to save water. Aldosterone will cause us to save sodium, but atrial natriuretic peptide will cause us to lose sodium, and parathyroid hormone causes us to save calcium back out of the filtrate. We adjust sodium and potassium in the collecting duct cell so that we have a gradient to pull sodium in. As sodium is actively transported in, some of these molecules are secondarily transported in with it. Water can pretty much go straight through. Lipid-soluble substances go pretty much straight through. A lot of ions and urea use the paracellular route to get back into the blood. The third step in urine formation is secretion. We need to eliminate some substances from the blood. Hydrogen ions, potassium ions, ammonia, creatinine, and certain other metabolic compounds have to be eliminated from the blood. This secretion step is also an important way we dispose of drugs and drug metabolites. Here is where we eliminate the nitrogenous waste that were absorbed passively, the urea and the uric acid. Because we actively eliminate hydrogen ions or don't eliminate hydrogen ions from the filtrate, this is how the kidney controls blood pH. Secretion is primarily accomplished in the proximal convoluted tubule. So if we look at the whole process, we have here, most of the stuff is reabsorbed. 
here in the proximal convoluted tubule. In the loop, we're concerned with water and ions primarily. And then as we get up here, we have aldosterone and parathyroid hormone controlled by hormones. We have water control by antidiuretic hormone here in the collecting duct. And we have some active secretion of things like urea, potassium, and hydrogen. The kidneys are responsible for controlling water balance in the body. This is primarily a function of the nephron loop. They use something called a countercurrent mechanism. The tissue osmotic concentration increases the deeper into the medulla of the kidney that you go. The descending limb of the loop of Henle is permeable to water. So as we go into more concentrated areas, water leaves by osmosis. The ascending limb is permeable only to ions. So as we go up and we start getting into less concentrated areas, sodium and chloride will leave and go into the tissue. Antidiuretic hormone will have an effect on the water reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule and primarily in the collecting duct. So if we need to reabsorb water, we can do so using hormonal controls. The osmolality of blood is about 300 milliosmol. So since we make the filtrate from the blood, our filtrate is going to be about 300 milliosmoles. As the filtrate is collected, and comes into the renal medulla, it comes in at 300 milliosmoles. But the tissue surrounding the loop gets more and more concentrated. The osmolarity goes up. So since only water can leave this descending loop, water leaves by osmosis in response to the concentrated tissue. When we're down here in the bottom, that filtrate has the same osmolarity as the tissue around it, 1200 milliosmoles. As we go back up, Water can't get out, but sodium chloride can. So the sodium chloride comes out as we get into less concentrated areas. We end up producing a filtrate that is more dilute than what we started with. And this is typically how this operates. Our urine is more dilute than our blood. If we have a well hydrated person, we're going to make that dilute urine just like we saw. But if we're dehydrated, we're going to secrete some antidiuretic hormone. We'll still have this same concentration, and the filtrate that leaves the distal convoluted tubule will still be dilute. But antidiuretic hormone will open water channels in the collecting duct. So as this collecting duct goes back down through that very concentrated medullary tissue, water will leave, water will leave, water will leave, and we'll end up with that concentrated urine. That way we've saved the water back and we've allowed the solutes to leave. Diuretics are chemicals that enhance urinary output. Alcohol is a pretty potent diuretic because it inhibits the release of antidiuretic hormone. This means that your body does not pay attention to signals about being dehydrated. Other diuretics inhibit sodium reabsorption, and since water always follows sodium, that's obligatory water reabsorption. So if we don't save sodium, we don't save water. Diuretics are typically prescribed for people with hypertension or congestive heart failure. They want to get as much fluid out of them as they can. Loop diuretics, like Lasix, inhibit the formation of a medullary gradient, so we don't have that increasing osmolality as we go down the loop of Henle. They tend to act at that ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Thiazides are a little less potent. They act at the distal convoluting tubule. Osmotic diuretics are some substance in the filtrate that's not reabsorbed. As a result, water travels with it. This is what happens in diabetes mellitus. All of the glucose is not reabsorbed and water is tagging along with the glucose. That's why diuretics have more frequent urination. Renal clearance is one way of evaluating renal function. Renal clearance is the volume of plasma from which the kidney clears, that means it completely removes a particular substance in a given time, usually one minute. Inulin is a non-metabolized substance that can be given. It's freely filtered, it's neither reabsorbed nor secreted. So if we give it to someone and it's in their bloodstream, it's all going to come out in the urine. 
the renal clearance of inulin will equal to the glomerular filtration rate. To do a renal clearance test, you give a dose of inulin, you check the blood level, and then you allow urine to be collected for a period of time, usually 24 hours. You check the blood level again to make sure it's all out of the blood, and then you check how much is in the urine. There's some calculations that have to be done. A normal glomerular filtration rate is 125 milliliters per minute. Chronic renal disease occurs when the glomerular filtration rate is less than 60 milliliters per minute for at least three months. This develops very slowly and very silently. There are no real symptoms of this disease. Filtrate formation decreases, nitrogenous wastes accumulate in the blood, and the blood becomes more acidic as the blood pH cannot be controlled by the kidneys. Common causes of this disease are diabetes mellitus and hypertension. Renal failure occurs when the glomerular filtration rate drops to less than 15 milliliters per minute. Filtrate production decreases or stops completely. A condition called uremia develops. This literally means urine in the blood. There are so many nitrogenous waste products in the blood, the kidney's not clearing any of them. People in renal failure feel fatigued, anorexia, nausea, they have mental changes and experience muscle cramps. These people need hemodialysis. Hemodialysis uses an artificial kidney that's outside the body to clean the blood. The chemical composition of urine is 95% water. There are, of course, urea and other nitrogenous wastes like uric acid and creatinine in it. That's the purpose of making urine. We will have ions in the urine to varying degrees depending upon your intake. Things that should not be in the urine, abnormal substances, include red blood cells, proteins, white blood cells, bile pigments, and glucose. In terms of physical characteristics, urine is normally clear and has a pale yellow color due to the pigment urochrome. Fresh urine actually doesn't smell that bad. However, if it sits for a while, bacteria may produce ammonia and that's what gives it the unpleasant odor. Urine is normally slightly acidic, with the pH being about 6 in most people. And it is a little denser than water. It should have something in it besides water. We measure density by doing specific gravity. Normal specific gravity for urine is 1.001 to 1.035. The ureter is a muscular tube from the pelvis of the kidney to the urinary bladder. The tube has three layers a mucosa, a muscularis, and an adventitia. The mucosa is epithelial mucosal cells. The muscularis is a layer of smooth muscle, circular muscle that goes around the tube. And the adventitia is connective tissue that anchors the ureter to the abdominal wall. Whenever urine from the kidney flows into the ureter, it causes the ureter to be distended. This stimulates peristaltic contractions that will push the urine to the urinary bladder. So this is not a gravity drainage system, it actually is a pushing system. Renal calculi are kidney stones. They occur whenever calcium, magnesium, or uric acid salts crystallize or precipitate in the kidney. As they move from the kidney to the ureter, they can obstruct the ureter. This will cause urine to back up in the kidney, giving you hydronephrosis. Whenever peristaltic contractions occur around the stones, it's very painful. The stones may have sharp edges. Things that predispose people for kidney stones are recurrent bacterial infections, anything that causes urine retention, and high blood levels of calcium. Also having an alkaline urine promotes kidney stone formation. The stones can be broken down by ultrasound. This is a process called lithotripsy, or they can be surgically removed. The urinary bladder is a muscular sac that stores urine until it's convenient to eliminate it from the body. The ureters come down and actually enter at the bottom, and then the urethra for urine exit is at the bottom. So there's this little triangle of openings called the trigone. Because urine tends to stay in this area, this is where infections persist in the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder has a pretty good storage capacity. It's very distensible. Like the stomach, it has rugae, so it can collapse down, but then we can have it distend quite a bit as a result of these folds that can expand. A moderately full bladder usually holds about 500 milliliters of urine. That's about a pint. 
Maximum capacity is somewhere between 800 and 1,000 milliliters. 1,000 milliliters is close to a quart. The urethra is a muscular tube from the bladder to the exterior. There is an internal urethral sphincter that is an involuntary muscle. It keeps the urethra closed when urine is not being passed. It helps prevent leakage. The external urethral sphincter is voluntary. Over the course of the first couple of years of life, people learn to control this. The length of the urethra varies in men and in women. Because women have a shorter urethra, they're more susceptible to urinary tract infections. Urinary tract infections occur when bacteria enter from the urethral opening and travel up the mucous membrane to the bladder. Urine is an excellent culture medium. It's wet, it's warm, and it has lots of food in it. Bacteria thrive there. Women have a shorter urethra, and flora from the gastrointestinal tract in the vagina provide a source of microorganisms that can travel up the urethral opening. Urinary tract infections are what we call ascending infections. They start with urethritis, just the urethra is inflamed, cystitis if it's the bladder, pilitis and pyelonephritis if the kidney becomes involved. Symptoms of a urinary tract are dysuria or painful urination, an urgency and a frequency. Sometimes there's fever. The urine is usually cloudy and may even be blood tinged. Because the urethra in the male has to travel through the penis, it's much longer. While there are still bacteria at this opening, it takes a long time for them to get to the bladder. In women, it's a much shorter trip. Frequent urination helps keep the bacteria flushed out of either system. Now here in the female, here you see the trigone, the ureter openings, the urethral opening. Same thing here in the male. In the male, the urethra passes through the prostate gland. This is called the prostatic urethra and then through the penis. This is called the spongy urethra to get to the external urethral orifice. The intermediate urethra is right here as it passes through. So this is how urine has to escape from the body. Micturition is the act of voiding or urination. Stretch receptors in the urinary bladder trigger the need to void. The receptors will adapt, so you may be able to put off voiding for a while, but at some point in time you have to void. The stretch receptors will win and will overcome any voluntary control you have over this. After the age of two or three, the external sphincter is usually voluntarily controlled pretty much 24 hours a day. Micturation usually occurs before the volume of urine in the bladder exceeds 400 milliliters. After micturation, only about 10 milliliters of urine are left in the bladder, and it's usually left in that trigone area, which is why it is a place where urinary tract infections will tend to persist. Urinary incontinence is an inability to control urination in an adult. Usually this is the result of weakened pelvic floor muscles. Stress incontinence occurs when there is a sudden increase in intra-abdominal pressure that causes urine to leak from the urethra. Overflow incontinence occurs when urine dribbles whenever the bladder is overfull. Urinary retention is when the bladder is unable to completely empty. This is fairly common after general anesthesia, which is why after you've had surgery, outpatient surgery, and you want to go home, they want to make sure you urinate once to make sure that you can void. Hypertrophy of the prostate in men can cause urinary retention. You'll remember that the urethra goes through the prostate gland. If the prostate starts to overgrow or if it's inflamed and swells, it can clamp down on the urethra and prevent the bladder from emptying completely. If urine is retained for too long a period of time, catheterization will be done to help prevent bladder trauma. About 1 in 600 people have a condition called horseshoe kidney. Instead of the kidneys separating into two distinct units, they stay fused together. Usually people with horseshoe kidney have no symptoms whatsoever and may not know they have this condition unless they just happen to get an MRI or an x-ray done. Hypospadias is a congenital abnormality seen in males. Here the urethra opens on the ventral surface of the penis instead of at the tip. This is typically corrected surgically by about 12 months of age. Polycystic kidney disease is a group of disorders that's characterized by the kidney becoming filled with fluid-filled cysts. 
Usually this is the glomeruli that stop functioning and fluid just collects in them. One form of the disease is caused by a dominant gene. This is called an autosomal dominant PKD. This is less severe. It occurs in about 1 in 500 people. Usually people don't show symptoms of kidney disease until they're about age 40. By about age 60, they're in need of a kidney transplant. The other type of disease is the autosomal recessive, that is, you need two recessive genes. This is less severe, but fortunately much less common. It only occurs about once in 20,000 people. Half of the people with this die just after birth because the kidneys come so badly damaged that once they no longer have mother filtering their blood, they just can't keep up with it. Renal failure typically occurs in childhood. Again, these people need dialysis and transplants. As we age, the first thing that happens is we need to gain control of the external urethral sphincter. Some children have trouble doing this and may bedwet until they're relatively old. Bedwetting is called enuresis. Bedwetting, particularly in older males, has a familial characteristic to it. So if your son is a bedwetter, there's a good chance your husband was a bedwetter too. We're not sure what causes this completely, but these individuals seem to have a slightly smaller bladder and they just can't go through the night. Most problems as we hit middle age are with infections. Our gastrointestinal flora is right there at the urethral opening and can easily get in. And sexually transmitted diseases may inflame the urinary tract. By the age of 80, our glomerular filtration rate has declined by 50%. Diabetes, which is more prevalent in the elderly, place people at a risk for renal disease. The bladder shrinks and loses some of its tone. This means that there is more frequent urination. Nocturia may develop. This is a need to urinate at night. Now this is different from enuresis. In nocturia you actually wake up and go to the bathroom. Also as you age incontinence is more common. Those pelvic floor muscles weaken and just aren't as strong as they used to be.